as I was at the funeral, one of the family members come up to me that I had taught at his church. It was a Baptist church. And one of the teachings that we were teaching on were words of knowledge, giving words of knowledge, and praying for the sick. Well, in this Baptist church that we were in, 50% of the congregation got healed that day. 50% of the congregation got healed. Isn't that amazing? Well, my family member comes to me at my grandfather's funeral, and he, and he was calling the words of knowledge uh, word, miracle words. This, that was the language that he was using. He said, you remember those miracle words that you were giving the last time you were here? He said, I was surprised that not only was I healed, but I am still healed. Like, that's good news, right? And he was like, listen, my wife is dealing with something. We're at my grandfather's, in, in the funeral service, people are coming up to me now. He says, my wife is dealing with something. Can you pray for her? And before I realized that me and my wife are giving words of knowledge in my grandfather's funeral service, praying for the sick, people getting healed. Come on now. The Holy Spirit comes upon one, one guy, so we figured we might better take him outside. And people are still coming into the service. So we take him outside, and I should have took in, taken him away from the entrance door. Wisdom was not upon me in that moment. And so we take him just right outside the entrance door. We begin to pray for him, and boom. He, he's, lay, he's laying in the ground at this funeral, and people are getting up, walking around like, what in the world's happening? What kind of funeral service is this? You know, I mean, it's just blowing people's mind. You know, people that didn't even know God, they're getting out. I mean, he's out there shaking under the power of the Holy Ghost. And I'm thinking, oh, man, this is why I'm bald. Things like, God puts me in situations like this where I, I pull all my hair out. But isn't that a great way to celebrate my grandfather's home going? He would, he would have loved that. And I know he was in heaven with Jesus then. That's my grand boy. That's my grand boy. Come on. And it's, all because, and it's all because of the teachings that you will find in this book. I would like to give this book away this morning. But I would like to give this book away to someone that is intending to do missions, but not just missions, but church planning and missions. Anybody that runs up here the fastest? Anybody that runs up here the fastest? Oh, 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 don't hurt yourself. <laughs> that, was, that was their workout this morning. Dr. Clark made me get up at 6.30 this morning to do workouts. This man is in, in, he's in an incredible shape. Like I'm sitting, I'm doing workouts, doing ab workouts and stuff with him, and I'm dying, you know. And he's like, how are you doing? And I can barely, he's talking normal voice. I'm like, I'm okay. I'm making it, Dr. Clark. Like he's killing me. And usually I'm already running around by now preaching, but I can't hardly move my legs. This man, He's killing me. But I do have a message this morning. It's a theme, it's a topic that the Lord continues to take me back to recently over the past couple of months. And I don't know about you, but there are certain portions of Scripture that God just constantly takes me back to. And this constantly causes me to engage to the stories, engage to the truth that it's teaching. And this one truth that he's teaching me right now, and it's the topic that I want to talk about this morning, is imitating Jesus. How many of us know there's no better role model for life than Jesus Christ? And in fact, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 says, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Isn't that an amazing statement? But the verse that he keeps taking me back to is found in 1 John chapter 2. Verse 6. And it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, the one who says, listen to this, he abides in him. 
ought himself walk in the same manner as he walked. He who says that he abides in him, speaking of Christ, ought to walk in the same manner as he walked. Amen. Let me say that again. I don't know if you're getting this. He who says that he abides in him ought to walk in the same manner. I don't know about you, but often scripture contradicts my experience. Can you really look at your life right now and say, I am walking just like Jesus on this on planet earth. I am a true representation of Christ on earth. But that's exactly what we're called to be. So something has to shift. You see, any truth that's not demonstrated through you hasn't been fully realized in you. You see, when I study scripture, I study it until I believe it. How do I know I believe it? I see it demonstrated through my lifestyle. And so when I go back to the scripture and I see that it says, if, if I say I abide in him, I ought to walk as he walked. And then I look at my actions and I look at my lifestyle and in some of those areas it's not exactly lining up. So I understand that this truth still needs to be realized in me. That there's still a partnership that needs to happen with this truth until it's fully demonstrated through my life. You see, your actions will always reveal your belief systems. But if we're called to live like Jesus on planet Earth, I believe there's a couple of perspectives that we need to have. And there's a couple of views that we need to have of Jesus when we study the Scriptures. And right now, there's at least two perspectives that you either will have when you study the life of Christ in the Gospels. Most of us will have this perspective here, that Jesus lived for me. And that's truth, right? He came to this earth, and he came to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He came to establish access to the Father in which we couldn't gain that access for ourselves. But oftentimes we read the Gospels and we only see what Jesus did in his Godhead. We never relate to what he was doing as something that we're called to do. Now this perspective shifts the way that we read the Gospels. And the perspective I think we need to have this morning is that Jesus lived as us. He didn't just live for us, he lived as us. In Philippians chapter 2, it says this, Therefore, have this attitude in yourselves, which also is in Christ Jesus, who although existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Now this verse reveals that everything that he did, he did as man, not as God. Now, he was fully man and fully God, correct? But what he did on planet Earth was through his manhood, not his Godhead. And that's why he was able to say in John 14, verse 12, he who believes in me and the works that I do would not only do these works, but even greater. There's another truth right there, right? Jesus himself says, you will not only do what I'm doing, but you will do even greater works. It, it, it's time that we actually start believing this stuff. It, it's time that we actually start allowing what the Word says about who we are really shift everything that we are on the inside until it's fully realized so it can be demonstrated. And so if Jesus came and lived as us and he role modeled the life and lifestyle of a believer, what are some of the things that characterize his lifestyle? Well, I want to share some of those with you this morning. Specifically, I want to share eight of them with you this morning. Now, some of you already, when I said eight, you're thinking, oh, my God, he's preaching for three hours. I might. No, I'm not. Because trust me, when lunchtime comes, I'm the first one out of here because food is my love language. 
And I'm going to find some fried chicken around here somewhere. As a matter of fact, several months ago, me and my wife were going through the book, The Five Love Languages. Anybody ever read that? And I was looking through all the five love languages, and I told my wife, I said, babe, mine's not in here. This is wrong. She's like, what do you mean? I said, food is not in here. Like, I understand that in the five love languages, it said, well, it's really the acts of service. No, it's really the fried chicken that, that is sitting in front of me. It's really the steak. It's really the hamburger. It's not the act of service of preparing it. No, it's me eating it. That's the love language. Okay, I'm getting off. I need to reel it back in here. So I want to share with you some things that characterize the life of Jesus. And as we go through some of these things, I want us to evaluate what we are in this journey. Because we're all on this journey. We may be in different places in this journey, but we're all on this journey of becoming fully like Christ on earth. And the very first thing that I want to share with you this morning is that Jesus was a servant. Oh, boy. Jesus was a servant. Mark chapter 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. Now, if there were any, ever anyone that deserved to be served, it was Jesus. But yet, he himself came and says, My, I didn't come to be served, but I came to actually serve. You see, it's the heart of a father that comes under to serve his children. It's the heart of a father to not only serve his children, but to exalt them. You see, God's delight is in the exaltation of his children. That's the reason the scripture says, He who humbles himself in the presence of the Lord shall be exalted in proper time. Too, too often we try to exalt ourselves, and we call it understanding our identity. Okay, we didn't get that. Too many times we read scripture and we try to exalt ourselves as sons and daughters, but we call it understanding our identity instead of realizing, no, how I am exalted in the eyes of the Father is understanding my role as a son and as a daughter, but remaining humble and coming to my dad and exalting him in everything that I do. And with that process, the Father says, no, oh no, you cannot outdo me. I'm going to serve and exalt you because you're my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter. You see, God delights in serving his children. This principle was based, best demonstrated to me by my pastor, Pastor Les Till. He was a vineyard church pastor. And also Pastor Lewis Johnson. Both of them, what they would do with us as leaders, as we were serving them, they would invite us leaders to their home. They would get a bucket of water. That's what we say in Alabama, bucket of water. If they would get this water and they would sit all of us leaders down and then they would wash our hands and feet. This is our pastors doing this for the leaders. And I would sit here and my pastor would be washing my feet. Now, at first it was a little weird for some dude to be rubbing my feet. It was a little weird. But as he continued to wash my feet, the Lord began to show me, this is me. This is me serving you right now. And I, and I learned through my pastor the heart of a servant. Because he never asked me to do what he wasn't willing to do himself. And when he began to teach me that, I told my pastor, I said, Pastor, I want to adopt a neighborhood and serve the neighborhood. Kind of like adopt a mile, you go and pick up trash and things. And so I did. I adopted this neighborhood in our city, and I just began week after week, month after month, just go to this community and just begin to serve the community. I would mow the grass. I would feed them. We would do cookouts. Whatever I can do just to serve the community, I began to do. 
And through, and through serving them, people would often begin to come to me one by one saying, what is this that you're doing? And I was able to share with them the gospel. In one particular event that we did, we actually did a concert for this community outside. And I have a really great friend that he plays Christian blues. Come on now, that's, that's an interesting dynamic, right? A blue Christian, right? But while he's playing this concert in this community, because of the relationship that we had as a church of just serving them, the people just came out, and as he, were, as he was playing, people began to be healed in the, in the audience, out in the streets. People, this one lady began to manifest demonically, and I'm thinking, oh, this is fine, because I get to do this stuff. And I walk over and I, and I gently grab this lady, and her entire family not only gets delivered from the demonic entities, demonic influence, but they all give their life to Jesus and get healed. Come on. It, it, it got to the point that when every time I walked into the neighborhood, all the children in the neighborhood would come out and follow me down the streets. And I would be walking down the streets, and there would be like 50 kids behind me because they knew I had chocolate, kind of, one way. <laughs> but then I began to be invited to their parties. And this is where, where the rubber meets the road. Are you going to go to the party? Or are you going to worry about what your Christian friends think of you being at this party? Because at this party, they're, they're drinking their alcohol, they're smoking whatever they're going to be smoking, they're doing the bongs. And so they began to invite me to their party, but when I would go in, go in they would stop what they were doing. Because they would honor me. Not because of I, I, I demanded it, not because I said it, not because I Bible beat them. It was because they respected the king that I carried. They respected something about my life that when I came in, they realized I don't need to be doing this. And they began to be convicted. And after I would go to the parties, people would begin to call me one by one saying, I'm tired of this lifestyle. I didn't want to say this in front of my, my friends, but I want what you have. And people just begin to give their life to Jesus. And at the time, our church was around 30 people. And over the course of about two years of serving this community and changing some things about our service, our church grew from 30 to 400. But it all, I believe, it's, it, it started with, the, with this concept it started with this thing of serving the community with no ulterior motive the serving the community saying I want to come and be a blessing to you I want to come and serve and exalt you and lift you up in your life today are you demanding people to serve you or are you serving people Eventually, I became an associate pastor for this church, and we were a mobile church. We had to turn this gym into a, a church service every Saturday night and do church Sunday morning. And I made sure I was the first person there and the last person to leave. I wanted, to, I wanted the people to see me as a pastor, what my pastors had demonstrated to me. I wanted them to see from me, I'm not here to tell you what to do, I'm here to show you what to do. It's time, to, it's time for the words to begin to be demonstrated through actions. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 20 says, For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power demonstration. It's, at some point, our words need to stop and our demonstration needs to begin. You see, Jesus came to serve. The next thing I would like to share with you is that Jesus was willing to suffer for others. 1 Peter 2, 21, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, listen to this, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Hebrews chapter 5, 8, Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Jesus was willing to suffer for people. 
You see, we live in a day and a time now, and it's because the church hasn't embraced a theology of suffering, we're beginning to present a gospel void of love. Only pure, unconditional love will cause you to suffer for someone else. You see, when Jesus was looking at you, when he was going to the cross, he wasn't just going to the cross, he was going through the cross. Because his focus wasn't on the sacrifice that needed to be made. You see, pure love doesn't consider the sacrifice that it needs to be made for someone. Pure love only considers the separation that's at hand from the one who needs to encounter love. And so Jesus looks at the cross, and he, he doesn't just go to that cross. He is not looking at the cross. He's looking through that cross because the Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, and you and I are that joy set before him. Okay, no one's excited about that. I, 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 I said Jesus thinks you're to die for. He was dying to be with you. Did you get that? He was dying to be with you. He, he, he looked at that cross and said, there, not even death can keep me from this person. Not even death can keep me from them because I am so in love with this person, I don't consider the sacrifice that needs to be made. There's just a separation, and I am going through this cross to get remove this place of separation so that I and them can be together. You see, the reason this, this one point means so much to me is because I grew up in a home. Both of my parents were alcoholics. It would be safe to say that they were atheists. Didn't even believe God existed. And because I grew up in that environment, I took on the idea that God didn't exist as well. Because of the life that I saw through the place that, that I was in, I didn't see anything that would show me that God was real. By the age of 15, I was a full-blown alcoholic and drug addict. When I say that I was doing drugs, I'm talking about I was doing cocaine, crack cocaine, crystal meth, mushrooms, marijuana, anything that I can get my hands on, that's the drug of choice that I was using. 15 years old. You see, I was going down this life of destruction, and that was the only life that I understood. That was the only life that I knew. And see, and for me, God couldn't have possibly be real. There's no God. May of 2005, I was 20 years old at the time. I'm 32 now. I overdosed on drugs. And I find myself in a situation, I find myself lying in a hospital bed with both of my kidneys completely failed on me, my other major organs failing, and the doctors are coming in saying, William, we don't want to alarm you or get you afraid, but you're going to die if your other organs fail. And so I found myself in the situation that only a loving God, only a real God could get me out of. And you see, because I, I, was, I was an atheist in my mindset, I wasn't in there praying for revival. <laughs> I, I wasn't in the hospital room praying for God to come heal me. And there's something else that you must understand. I, I grew up in Alabama in the Bible Belt, which means... It's culturally relevant for most of the people just to go to church on Sunday morning because that's what you do. Which means I was surrounded by Christians but never heard the name Jesus ever mentioned. I had friends that were so-called Christians but never once told me that there was a hope for my situation. I was interacting with Christians every single day without realizing it, but they never told me the gospel. I went through 20 years of my life and I never heard the name Jesus. 
here in America. But as I was laying in that hospital bed, and as I was dying, all of a sudden, and most of us, not all of us here, you were going to have these all of a suddens in your life. And all of a sudden, this light literally shines into my hospital room. Just like a spotlight. And I'm thinking, what in the world is going on? And not only did a light shine into this hospital room, but the man be- walks out of the light. I'm talking about like David. He it was a person walked out of the light. It wasn't like a little vision. A person walked out of this light into my hospital room. He was wearing a white gown. He had brown hair with a brown goatee. A very good looking guy like myself. We know this. He didn't have wings or anything like that. But this man begins to walk toward my bed. And as he begins to approach my bed, this overwhelming presence begins to come upon me. And I just begin to vibrate under the power of this being. And as he approached, I began to experience this overwhelming love that I had never experienced before. Never. And as he approached my bed, he gets right in front of me. At this point, he hasn't said anything to me. He turns and just sits down on the floor. Now, when he sits down on the floor, another strange thing happens. A river of water literally bursts from the wall. It starts flowing in the floor out the other side of the wall. And I'm thinking, man, I have lost it. I'm like, I'm not, ima- I'm not imagining this stuff. This is happening right here in front of me in the hospital room. What would you be thinking? He sits down beside this river of water. He begins to wash his hands in this water. And as soon as he begins to wash his hands in this water, an audible voice speaks to me. An audible voice. And the audible voice said, the waters that you see will purify and cleanse you if you receive Jesus the Christ as Lord and Savior. And as soon as I heard the voice of my creator, my created being said, yes, to my creator. And immediately the power of God hits me. Come on now. The power of God hits me. And all of a sudden he just disappears. All night long, this power is just surging on me. The next morning, the doctors come in, and they begin to do tests and things with me, and they have this freaked out look on their face. They come back, and they said, William, not only are your kidneys better, but it's as if you have new ones. (laughs) Not only are your other organs working properly, but it's as if you've never done drugs before in your life. You see, the first time I heard the gospel was from an angel, but I should have heard it from a Christian. Let me say it this way. I should have heard it from you. Why didn't you tell me about him? Why didn't you tell me that there was hope to my pain? Why didn't you tell me that there was healing to my sorrow? Why didn't you tell me that there was freedom to my addiction? Why didn't you tell me that there was a God, his name is Jesus, that can change everything there is about me? You see, I'm asking you this question because you're passing people every day that's dying, that's hurting, but you have the one. You have the name of the one that can change their life. Are you demonstrating Jesus? And so when I read this, this verse, where it says, Christ came to suffer for me, it, it makes me understand that if he could choose me, I wouldn't have chosen me. Even though I didn't believe he existed, even though, even though I didn't care, even though I wasn't praying for revival, wasn't seeking him, he so was in love with me that he came down into my world as if I was the only one that existed and said, I love you. 
And so when I read this verse, that Christ suffered for others. It brings this whole new revelation to me because I understand it firsthand that he thinks I'm to die for. That he is so in love with me that not even the cross can keep him from me. Let me ask you, who are you suffering for in your life today? Who are you becoming the bridge in which people can walk across to get from where they are to where they need to be? You see, love requires you to become a sacrifice. Because Jesus said, no perfect love is there than this, than one shall lay down his life for his friends. You see, Jesus thinks you're to die for, but do you think he's worth living for? The next thing I would like to share with you this morning is that Jesus yielded his agenda. He yielded his agenda. John chapter 5 verse 19 says, Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Jesus says, my will is to do the will of my Father. He was one that fully laid down his agenda to pick up the agenda of, our, of his Father. But how many times... Do we plan God around our time instead of our time around our God? We're so focused on our life that we say, God, you only have three minutes while I'm in the shower to speak to me, so hurry up. Right? Listen, God will speak to you there, but I'm asking you, are you willing to lay down your agenda? Are you willing to wake up in the morning and say, Father, what are you doing today? Because my agenda isn't as important as your agenda. Jesus laid down his will to pick up the will of the Father. A couple of months ago, me and my wife were driving in a car, and someone had given her a prophetic art card and told her that this would be a prophetic word for someone that we would meet. Now, you, you just heard that I, I love food, and it was around lunchtime. <laughs> and my wife looks over at me, and she says, I feel like God is telling us to go over to this business. There's someone there we need to give this prophetic art card to. And I already could see Chick-fil-A right in front of me. Pray, it's a Christian organization. Come on. And, and, and here she is trying to change our agenda. Like, baby, we're going to eat. In my mind, I start this argument with God, you know. And I start this argument with her. She doesn't even know it. <laughs> I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, babe, what is wrong with you? I am hungry. You know, it's, t- it's lunchtime. Chick-fil-A is right there. I already have the combo in my mind. I already have the waffle fries with the Chick-fil-A sauce already on it in my imagination. And here you are talking about, let's go give a prophetic word. What? Like, get with it. First things first, eat, then we go get the prophetic word. I mean, it's, I mean this, I'm telling you, I love food. Sometimes even when I'm preaching, people's heads, like, turn into hamburgers. Like, I'm completely out of it, you know. I don't even know what I'm saying. Like, All I can see is that cheeseburger. <laughs> And so obviously my wife's more spiritual than me. <laughs> and so she, she, and she's consistent about this. Like on the outside, I'm like, yeah, sure, baby. I'm full of faith and power. <laughs> but on the inside, I'm like, oh, what's wrong? <laughs> Food. And so I listen to my wife, which is the Holy Spirit speaking to me most of the time. Husbands, that's a good point. 
And so we go to this one particular business, and then when we, when we pull up, and I, have, you know, I still have this thing going on inside of me because now we're, I see not Chick-fil-A in front of me. I see Chick-fil-A in my mirror. It's behind me. And I'm like looking at it, you know. And we pull up into this business, and now only this, he looks at me and says, okay, now you go in and give him a prophetic word. I'm like, and now i got to prophesy. I'm like, I am in no place to prophesy right now. Like, God cannot use me right now. I'm defiled. I'm listening to my flesh. <laughs> I'm probably going to go in and ask for like $10 to go buy a combo. <laughs> and so I'm like, yeah, baby, I can do that. I grab this prophetic art card. And I walk in, and in my mind, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to talk to the first person I see. A lot of prayer went into this, right? A lot of it. And I just, boom, open the doors out because I was angry. You know, it's not a good way to evangelize. Don't kick the door into my, who needs God? Don't do that. <laughs> you know, I, it's not the anger of the Lord that leads you to repentance. <laughs> it's the kindness. And so I open kind of abrupt and I look over, you know, because I have that serious look, face, look on my face, you know. And I see this lady and she's like, oh, you, you can see it. It's like. What's happening? And I walk over and just hand this prophetic art card to her. It's just this picture, and then she's really like puzzled. What in the world is this? Oh, yeah. And as soon as I hand this piece of paper to her, the Holy Spirit that takes over my mouth, I begin to prophesy. She begins to weep right there on the spot. And her co-worker sitting right beside her says, you absolutely have no idea what you're saying to her right now. This, this, and this is going on. And what you're saying is completely speaking to that. And guess what happens? She encounters God because we changed our agenda. But what I want you to get from this story is that even though I was struggling along the way, even though, I, even though I had something else in my mind, even though I wasn't fully engaged into it, even though I didn't spend two hours in prayer, even though I wasn't seeking God in that moment, even though I wanted to eat, I still chose to follow his voice. You see, God is not, God is not celebrating your failures. He's celebrating your faithful victories. The only thing that God saw was that his son obeyed, was that his son changed his agenda to pick up the agenda of the Father. You see, some of us need to hear this right now. You may be struggling in, in some areas. You, you, you may have some doubts along the way, but the, the, my encouragement to you is, are you going in forward progress? Are you still following his voice? Because God is only interested in forward motion. He's only looking at forward motion. It may be like this. <laughs> but you're moving. You see, I've learned a lot from my wife lately. <laughs> But Jesus lived his life in a way that his entire life was established around the Father's purpose and will. And that very Christ, that very Jesus, has delegated to you and I his life. Has delegated to you and I his name, his authority, his kingdom to represent him as if it's himself doing it. That's what it means to be a Christian. It means little Christ. It means I am standing here, and what I am saying and doing is what Jesus would say and do if he was standing here right now in this moment. It means I have laid down my agenda to pick up the agenda of my Christ. The next thing I'd like to share with you. Is this okay this morning? is that Jesus lived a life of prayer. Luke chapter 5, verse 16. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Jesus would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. You see, I have this entire teaching on the wilderness season 
And I feel like us as a church have, have misconceptions of what the wilderness represents. But to Jesus, the wilderness rep represented a place of divine communion with the Father. But when you and I typically think about the wilderness, we think of a place of barrenness, right? We think of that's a season in life, that's a place I don't want to go. Well, in fact, for Jesus, if you look at Matthew chapter 4 and look through what he went through in his wilderness season, there are no recorded miracles until after he came out of the wilderness season in the Gospels. In fact, you can say it this way, Jesus defeated Satan in private before he triumphed over him in public. You see, the wilderness season is designed for you to discover Christ as your river source. The wilderness season is designed for you to discover divine communion with the Father. And Jesus often went to that place of prayer. And for Jesus, prayer wasn't asking God to do something. It was about being with God in conversation. Most of us talk to God in prayer but don't talk with God in prayer. Did you get that? If your prayer time is all you do is you ask God to do certain things, that's not a conversation. We all have family members that when they call us, oh, you know where this is going, right? All they want is what? You to do something for. What type of emotion do you have when you see them on the caller ID? Oh. Come on now. I know we're Christians. You know what I'm saying? What type of emotion do you think God has when he sees your name on the call ID? Is he looking forward to this conversation or he's like, oh, he wants me to play Santa Claus again? <laughs> Can we just be real? You see, for Jesus, prayer was about relationship. It wasn't about getting God to move in his life. It wasn't about getting God to do something for him. It was just about being with his Father, I don't waste my time in prayer asking God to do things. A matter of fact, I very seldom ask anything from God. I just want to talk with him. I just want to commune with him. I just want to be in relationship with the lover of my soul. And another thing about prayer is that many times the things that we're asking God to do for us, he's already given to us through Christ. Most of the time we're, we're, we're begging God to do things for us. He's like, listen, I've already done it for you. Let's move on to relationship. Because Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says what? You have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You see... The reason you don't see those things manifested or evident in your life is because you believe you don't have them. Any mindset that puts you in a place of defeat is rooted in a lie. You're already deceived. Any, any mindset that puts you outside of the resources of heaven is in deception. You see, I don't ask God for anything because I realize that in Christ I have everything. I realize it's already, already been released to me. He just wants to release it through me. You see, prayer is about communing with the Father so that he can move through you, not just for you. When I first got saved, all my prayer time... I thought that when I came up here to, to speak or whatever, that I had to spend at least six hours in prayer. And like, and all my prayer time was just literally trying to use God in a way that I want to be anointed when I go up and do something. I mean, literally, I, my entire first year was, was like that because I, I didn't know any better. I, that's what other people that were Christians demonstrated for me to do. So I thought that's what prayer was. It was not any, even in a place of communion. It was all about trying to perform for God. It was all about, I don't want to look stupid when I get in front of people. Okay, sometimes I may do that anyway. <laughs> don't allow your prayer to move away from relationship. Don't allow that to happen. The next thing I would like to share with you is that Jesus was led by the Spirit. Come on. 
Can I get an amen on this? Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Who led Jesus to the wilderness? The Spirit. You see, Jesus was led in everything that he did. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is our spirit guide. I can use that language. You have a spirit guide. His name's Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit leads you into all truth. So if there's any areas in your life that's it's, it's rooted in, in a lie, guess what? The Holy Spirit didn't lead you there. Because the Holy Spirit only leads you into a place of truth, not deception. To the degree that you yield to the spirit of truth is to the degree you'll be able to resist deception. Whew. Jesus lived his life in a way. He was so led by the Spirit, there was no room in him for a lie of Satan to enter. He was so led by the Spirit that there was nothing Satan can do or say that can penetrate his life and his heart. Because truth will always expose a lie. It's learning how to yield to the Holy Spirit. It's learning how to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and to teach us the Word of God. How do you know you're believing a lie if you don't have truth to expose it? Most Christians don't allow the Bible to get in the way of what they believe. Everybody smile. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit. I remember when the Lord began to teach me about this, about being led by the Holy Spirit. And at the time, me and my good friend Woody, we, we would do street ministry all the time. We would go and minister in the streets and just pray with people. Well, this one particular day, we were on our way back home, and he was driving, and driving with my friend Woody, he looks just like Woody on Toy Story. And it's the same name. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Like, as kids, we were, I, would, I would think, I have the real-life toy story with me. And my friend Woody is kind of like a space cadet. We all have friends that are space cadets, right? It's kind of it's out there somewhere. When he was driving, and it's like riding with Mr. Magoo. Like, you don't know what's going to happen, you know? You know how you ever seen Mr. Magoo? Like, he's just driving. He's, he's like he's blind. Well, Woody's like that. And so when you're, when you're riding with Woody, your faith increases. Your prayer life gets really strong. <laughs> really strong. Well, we're driving back home, and all of a sudden, I look out this window, and I see this black bird fly by the window. And I heard the Holy Spirit say this, direction to death. So I make this mistake. I look over at Woody, and I tell him about it. I said, Woody, I feel like God just told me this, this crow, this black bird represents direction to death. And before I get this out of my mouth good, he's like, ah, well, he's turning around to follow the bird. <laughs> I'm not crazy. Believe me, I'm not crazy. But we went bird watching that day. And sure enough, we get behind this black bird, and we're driving down the road. I'm like, we're taking turns and stuff. It's, it's amazing. And how this black bird was just flying directly over the highway. This bird flies into uh, this just driveway and lands in a tree above his home. Now, this house had this uh, a driveway that we had to drive down to get to. Well, we pull onto this driveway, and there's this man standing on the front porch with a gun in his hand. And I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm listening to the devil. This is directed to our death, Woody. Stop. You know, what is space good at? He don't even see it. Woody's like, oh, man, we're going after God. I'm like, no, we're, we're dying, man. We're going to die. And so then we pull up to the doorsteps, and then I'm like, what are we going to say to this guy? Uh, yes, we just followed a black bird to your home. We're full of wisdom and revelation. You need to hear it from us. Like, what am I going to say to this guy, you know? And so we pull up. Woody rolls the window down. I don't want him to talk. You don't know what he's about to say. 
And so I just speak over Woody, and these words just come out of our mouth. We feel like God sent us here because someone is dealing with death. Immediately he drops his gun and begins to weep. He says, my, my five-year-old son is in the hospital dying with pneumonia right now. And we get out of this car, and as soon as we get out, the power of God, poof, hits this guy on the porch. And not only did his son get healed, but his son got saved. But it was all because we trusted the voice of Holy Spirit. You see, the level of your trust determines the level of your obedience. The level of your trust determines the level of your obedience. You will never obey we don't fully trust. And we would have missed a divine moment if I would have said, no, that can't be from the Holy Spirit. It's not going to tell me to follow a bird. <laughs> well, guess what happens? Me and Woody get back into the car, and at this point, we're like, man, we could walk on water right now. I mean, we, our faith was like, woohoo! I mean, me and my friend Woody, we, we literally used to do this. We would, we would spend like 30, 40 minutes in prayer, and then we, would, then we would practice walking through walls. <laughs> Jesus did it! Like, we were like praying, and then we'd close our eyes, boom! Hit the floor. I'm like, Jesus did it, I'm gonna do it. I'm not crazy. I'm full of faith. And so we get back into the car, and guess what happens? Oh, oh, we see the black bird again. And Woody was like, let's do it. Let's go for it. We're back. We've, we're following this bird again. And sure enough, the bird flies over another home. There's this lady sitting on the front porch weeping. We get out of, the, out of the car, we walk up to him, and we say, excuse me, man, we feel like God sent us here because someone's dealing with death. She said, I just lost my husband and son in a car accident within six months. I don't believe God loves me or he's real. I said, well, let me tell you how we got here. <laughs> That's going to go really good or really bad. And so I, I explained to her, like, okay, this is how we got here. And she just begins to weep even more. And she says, you know what? God has to be real and he has to love me because for some two dudes to follow a black bird to come and tell me that God's real and that he loves me, he has to be. Whoa! It's okay. You don't have to get excited. And she gives her life to Jesus on the spot. She looks up to us after we held her and hugged her for about an hour and just wept with her. She says, my next door neighbor is a pastor and he's dying from an incurable disease. And so we walk next door, we knock on the door and the pastor's wife opens the door and we explain, says, listen, we feel like God wants to heal your husband. She shuts the door in my face. Because they didn't believe and divine healing. And the very ones that rejected the move of the Spirit was the Christians. You see, the world is craving for the Spirit that you have. And the only people that are afraid of it are the ones that are carrying it. Oh boy. You, 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 you need to get this. that The world is craving for the Spirit of God that lives inside of you. And the only people typically most of the time that are afraid of that spirit are the ones that, have, that are the carriers of it. The church is saying no and the world is saying yes. Look at your movies. All these supernatural, supernatural TV shows, supernatural movies, movies. People are dying for a true representation of Christ on earth. They're yearning for it. Romans chapter 8 says, For all of creation is awaiting eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. That's you. That's me. Literally, the creation is crying out, Awaken, O sleeper, 
Awaken, O sleeper, and realize you're a son. Realize you're a daughter. Realize you carry the Spirit of God. Everywhere that you go, every place that you enter, there are people there. There are things there crying out for you to reveal the Christ within. When your love for people grows greater than your fear of them, you'll begin to step out in power. When your love for people grows greater than your fear of them, you'll begin to step out. The next thing is that Jesus walked in power. Jesus walked in power. Matthew chapter 9, 35, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. John 14, 12, I've already quoted this. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also and even greater because I go to the Father. If we say we abide in him, we ought to walk. As he walked, let me ask you, are you living a life of power? Are you living a life of victory? The Bible says our victory is through Christ. If I'm not living victorious, then I may not be living it through Christ. Most people are in church, but they're not in Christ. Uh, Better leave that one alone. I was a youth pastor one time for about two years, and I would teach the kids about the power of God, and I would teach them about healing, and I would teach them about these things, and we would go out into the streets, and we would pray for people, and at that time, we had only seen people with back pain healed or different things of that nature, but I was like hungry so much for, for something more. I was like, I want my kids to experience something more than this. And so I took a step of faith. I said, listen, kids, I'm going to take you. We're going to go on a, a, little, a little bitty mission trip. Like, we didn't leave the country or anything. But we're going to go to a specific um, place, and we're going to pray for people. Well, we, some things happened, and we kind of ended up in a mall. And I took this group of kids with me. We broke up in groups of two and three. And, and I told all the kids, I said, listen, we're only going for people that are in wheelchairs. They're, lo- they're looking like they're about to die. You know, <laughs> that, that's the people that we're going for right now. So, I, you know, that's what we're doing. As soon as I get this out of my mouth in the mall, this guy with a wheelchair that goes by, I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> Had to see it. And so I walk up, I say, excuse me, sir, and I strike up a conversation with him, and he goes on to tell me that he had been paralyzed from the waist down from a car accident for the past 20 years. And then my faith was like, bye. <laughs> <laughs> you ever had people talk you into doubt? Like, after they got through telling you what was wrong with them, you're like, well, you're just going to die, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's how I felt in that moment. I was like, okay, if his God was going to be healed, he's not now. <laughs> and so I was like, well, let's let us pray with you. We feel like God wants to heal you. And then it, I shouldn't have said that because it started an argument. It just went on downhill from there, you know. I'm like, oh, okay, it's just agree to disagree. And can we pray for you? Then I looked at my kids, I said, okay, you lay hands on him and pray. <laughs> that way if nothing happened, it's on you. <laughs> right? Come on, that's what pastors do. <laughs> and, and what happened next just blew my mind. This hasn't happened before or since this time. My kids lay hand on this gentleman, on his shoulders, and begin to pray, and my right hand begins to shake. 
in this mall now, this is a huge mall, and I'm like, don't get Pentecostal in the mall. <laughs> like, we all have these Pentecostal friends, right? And the door greeters, you go to the church, they meet you at the door, ah, welcome. <laughs> I love Pentecostal. I am Pentecostal. Cares, man, whatever. But I had that thought, I was like, oh, we well, don't get Pentecostal in the mall now. And I started trying to control it, but the weirdest thing, I couldn't control it for some reason. And, and, and another strange thing begins to happen. I, I watched my hand start moving toward his hand. And I, in my mind, I'm like, don't grab his hand. Don't grab his hand. Don't! You know how you get like a little kid, you know, and start screaming. And, and I literally watched my hand grab this guy's hand. And when my hand grabbed his hand, I jerk him. I didn't do it. Holy Spirit knew to just bypass William. He's not going to do that. I jerk this guy. He stands up. The power of God hits his legs. All, all feeling of mobility goes to him. He starts celebrating Jesus in the mall. Come on! Jesus! It's a... Isn't this amazing? This guy starts walking in the mall, in the mall and at this time about 100 people gather around. And out of the corner of my eye, I see two security guards walking toward me. <laughs> and I've been kicked out of a few malls before, so I, was, I knew what to expect. <laughs> and they come and they grab me, you know, by the, by the arms and say, listen, dude, you cannot do this stuff here. They escort me out of the mall. So I wasn't able to get his information or anything, you know. I'm just saying, I'm just wondering what he's thinking. He's probably thinking like, this is just some good-looking bald angel that came and healed me. <laughs> right? Like, he probably thinks I'm Jesus or something, yeah? And so they, <laughs> they kicked me out of this mall. But what happened with my kids after that is for about six months, on their own, they did street ministry for four or five times a week on their own. And the youth group exploded. It's all because they saw a demonstration of power. If we're called to walk as Jesus walked, then we're called to do what Jesus did. The next thing I would like to share with you is that Jesus walked in authority. Matthew chapter 8, 28 through 34 says this. When he came to the other side in the country of the Gadarenes, two men were demon-possessed, met him as they were going, coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. And they cried out saying, what business do we have with each other, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? That's what the demon said to Jesus. Now there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance from them. The demons began to entreat him saying, if you are going, if you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And he said to them, go. And they came out and went into the swine, and the whole herd rushed down to the steep bank into the sea and perished in the waters. The herdsmen ran away and went, and went into the city and reported everything, including what happened to the demoniacs. And behold, listen to this, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they implored him to leave their region. <laughs> That's funny, right? As many things that I can pull out of this scripture, but the one point that I want to pull out of the scripture is how the demonic spirits responded to Jesus. When Jesus stepped onto the scene, they became afraid. When Jesus steps on the scene, they say, are you here to torment us before our time? Oh, that's an interesting statement too as well. You see, I believe in part that you and I, as God's delegated authority, are put on this planet to torment Satan. Wow. 
You see, you're not here for, for Satan to torment you. You're here to torment him. You see, when Satan looks at you, he sees the resurrected Christ. What did Jesus strip from Satan on the cross? His authority. The Bible says in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, that you have authority over all the power of the enemy. There's nothing he could do or say that you don't have authority over. But too often we as Christians we embrace mindsets, belief systems that empower the devil. Why do you think he's constantly trying to attack your identity? Because if he can cause your identity to come under his influence, then he can cause your delegated authority to come under his influence. And then he could actually cause you, your authority to be used to authorize his works. Much of what Satan is doing today has been authorized by Christians. Christians that have failed to realize, I carry the authority of Christ. I carry Jesus. I carry the name of the King of kings, the Lord of lords, that there's no power, there's no authority, there's no dominion that overpasses, that surpasses the kingdom that we carry. You, 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 you don't believe me yet. You don't believe me yet, so I'm going to read a verse to you. This is the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 and 20 says this. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He says, all authority has been given to me, so therefore go into all of the nations. But how many times do we enter places and we think, do I have authority there? That very belief system is what empowers the enemy to stop with the work that you're trying to do. Jesus has delegated you. He says, I have all authority, so therefore go into all. He didn't say, go into the, only go into the ones I have authority in. You carry a supreme authority. You carry a supreme kingdom. When you step onto the scene, the supreme kingdom, every other kingdom has to bow to the one you carry. Listen, I'm not mad at anybody here. I'm just mad at the devil. I'm tired of him trying to convince us that he has authority over us. I'm tired of us as believers re-empowering a devil that's been disarmed by the cross. He's been disarmed and defeated. He's as, he has as much authority in your life as you believe he does. James chapter 4 verse 7 says, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will what? Flee from who? You. The level of your submission determines the level of your resistance. Let me ask you, is Satan running to you or from you? You see, that verse is really not about Satan running from you. It's really about us submitting to the supreme, supreme king, Jesus. Any area of your life that's not submitted to God is already in deception. And in that place that's not submitted to God is already under the influence of Satan. You have the authority of Christ. You don't come in the name of yourself. That's how you can tell if you're coming in the name of yourself. Is that the enemy doesn't flee from you. When you come in the name of, when you stop bringing yourself to the table, you'll start bringing Christ to the table. You see, you're created in the image of God. 
And God has such a sense of humor. He just says, Satan, if you wanted to be me, because that's ultimately who he wanted to become was God. He says, I'm going to create beings in my image and defeat you through them. I'm not trying to tell you to go out for a fight. I'm just trying to tell you you're equipped for one. This one topic right here is something that's been really, really speaking to me lately. When I first gave my life to the Lord, the first year of my salvation was hell, I have to tell you. Because when, at night when I would lay in my bed, demonic spirits would enter my room and torment me. Sometimes they would even manifest in human form. Until one night I had this thought after I began to read scripture, because I knew scripture had an answer, and I realized I had authority over the enemy. And so I had this thought, the next time the spirits come, it was always at night, it was always around 3 o'clock in the morning, it would wake me up. I said, the next time they come to torment me, I'm going to torment them. And the next time they come into this room, I'm going to make them watch me worship God. And so, sure enough, 3 o'clock in the morning comes, the spirits come into the room, wake me up, and I say, oh, no, not tonight. I get a chair, I sit it in the floor, I says, watch me worship my king. And I begin to worship Jesus. I begin to celebrate God. I begin to exalt him before them. And guess what? They flee. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He's only interested in people he can influence. And if he cannot become a place of influence in your life, he will leave you alone. The last thing I want to share with you this morning. I know I'm a little bit long-winded speaker. Is this okay? I think most of my messages are really like three. <laughs> but I only have you for this moment right now. So. Jesus lived free from sin. Jesus lived a sinless life. The Bible says in Ephesians, I mean Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. If I say I abide in Christ, I are to walk as he walked. Is it possible that we can live sinless? I believe Scripture teaches so. You see, it's the Holy Spirit you have. When you yield to His holiness, <laughs> His holiness is demonstrated through you. But let me give you a key on how to walk this out. And it's found in a verse that every Christian in here knows because it's the very first Scripture that's presented to us as believers. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, for we are saved by grace through faith, listen to this, this is not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Is salvation the only thing found in Christ? We typically read that scripture in that way. It's only talking about salvation. You see, we enter the kingdom by grace through faith, but we, then we think it's operated in a different way. You see, grace appropriates what faith initiates. Grace is the empowering presence of God or the ability of God performing the work of God through you. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift. You see, the life of Jesus is a gift to be received, not an assignment to be achieved. The holiness of Christ is a gift to be received. I want you to get this. 
the, the opportunity, the ability to live a sinless life is by grace through faith. It's by realizing that Christ has defeated all and is all and triumphed over all. And that's my faith rest in his ability. Grace works it through my life. You see, this is easier than what you think. If the Christian life that you're living is difficult, then you're living it in your ability and not his. If you're struggling not to sin, then you're trying to overcome sin in your strength and your ability and not him who has overcome. You see, I just choose to rest in, who, in what he has done. And the more I come to the, real, the realization of what he has provided for me, let me say it this way. If you just simply look to the cross, you can only identify what's been finished. But if you learn to look through the cross, you can learn to identify what's been provided. Some of us are only looking to, to the cross, but we're not looking through the cross. And when I look through the cross, I see everything that Jesus has provided for me. And I realize that it's based upon what he has done, not based upon what I have done. And when I just receive what he's already provided, what he's already accomplished, when I put my faith in that, grace works the faith of God through us. Did you get that? Faith is found in rest, not striving. Too many Christians try to work their faith instead of rest their faith. Ah, you see why I'm bald now? I like want to rub my head right now. I'm passionate about these things. Can't you tell? I'm like, ah. it's the simple truths of the gospel that make the greater truths operational. And so often we miss these simple truths and we try to move on to a greater truth but realize we cannot operate in that truth without the foundation of grace working through faith, of the simple truth that creates the platform for the greater truth to be operational in our life. As a young believer, when I began to realize more and more that it's based upon what Christ has done for me. And if I would just align my life and align my heart and rest my faith in what he, who he is and what he has accomplished and provided, all of a sudden, grace appropriates what faith initiates. It's a gift of God. This is not of yourselves. Would everyone stand with me? I'm just going to invite the Holy Spirit to come. I'm not going to ask you to come up to the front because we are on a time schedule here. But I'm just going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and begin to touch you right where you are. And throughout this message, the Holy Spirit has already beginning, begun to touch people. But God, I'm going to ask him to come in a more powerful way. So Holy Spirit, I just invite you to come and rest upon your people. more, Lord. It's a gift to be received. I just want you to hold your hands out in front of you and receive. I bless what you're doing, Holy Spirit. I bless each and every person, each and every hero this morning. I ask that you would increase your work upon their life. 
I ask that when they leave from here today, they will be more empowered to live the life that you have called them to live, to walk out the destiny that you have called them to walk out, that they would understand that it's a gift to be received from you, Lord, that they would leave here and understand all I have to do is receive what Christ has accomplished. There's just a sweetness here right now. I just want you to, in your own way, just begin to turn your affections towards the Father and just begin to cry out to him in your own way. Just begin to turn your affections to him right now. You can either pray out loud or you can pray in your, within yourself. It's up to you. But I want you to take this moment that we're in right now and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to your heart. Can we get some music playing? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We just love resting in your presence right now, Father. We just love resting in your presence right now, Father. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. We just love seeking you. We just love delighting in you, Father. You are the reason that we're here. Our created being is designed to be in a relationship with you. Our created being is designed to be in divine communion with our creator. And right now, Father, we just rest. We just rest in you, Lord. Bless what you're doing, Holy Spirit. I ask that you increase it now. Increase it now. This lady right here on my right side in the pink. I just see the Holy Spirit all over you. Just hold your hands. There you go. Holy Spirit, I just bless what you're doing with her right now. There it is. There it is. Increase. Increase. In Whoa. There it is. There it is. This lady right in front of me in the green, you're standing in the aisle. The Holy Spirit, just, I just saw the Holy Spirit fall on top of your head. And I hear the Father saying that you are a daughter of worship, that you love worshiping him. You love adoring him. And so, Holy Spirit, bless that worshiping heart inside of her right now. More Holy Spirit. Oh, there it is. Go deeper. There it is. More love. More love. There it is. There it is. Can someone get around her, please? There it is. There it is. More, Lord. Increase. 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 More love. More love right now. There it is. I just see the hand of the Holy Spirit going deeper in your heart. And I feel like the Lord is saying, I'm stepping you into a new season. And this new season is going to be new births in certain areas of your lives. That there's certain things that you've been crying out for, that you've been contending for. And I hear the Lord saying, now is a birthing season for you. There it is. There it is. More, Lord. You too, this 
come up right here. I just bless the work of the Holy Spirit as upon you. I just see the hand of the Lord beginning to remove obstacles from the realm of thinking. That there's been certain things that's happened in your life that the enemy has tried to plant lies in. But I see the Lord destroying the lies and establishing truth. So I want you to just close your eyes and hold your hands up like you're receiving a gift. Just hold it out. There you go. Let's close your eyes. I'll bless what you're doing, Holy Spirit. There it is. There it is. More. More. Increase. Increase. More love right now. More love right now. There it is. You don't have to fight it. He's here to bless you. He's not here to hurt you. More. This result. Oh, there it is. Whoa. Thank you, Jesus. More. 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 I see the Lord placing this canopy around you, and I hear the Lord saying, now you're going to experience the Father's love. And I'm restoring some Father protection inside of your hearts and minds where you're going to re begin to understand him as the perfect father, a perfect father that loves his children, that protects his children, and provides for his children. There it is. More. 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 Holy Spirit, come in a greater way right now. I bless what you're doing in this room. I ask that you increase it right now. This lady right here, what does her shirt say? Can you tap her? I just see the Holy Spirit just drop on you just then. Just, just go ahead and, there it is. See, there it is. Holy Spirit, just go deeper inside of her right now. Let's go deeper inside of her right now. I just hear the Father saying over you, you are my daughter in your royalty. You are my daughter in whom I'm well pleased. I'm well delighted inside of you that there's things about you and there's things that you've contended for in prayer and there's things that you've released in prayer that you have no idea of what you've released, but you have literally released and unlocked things in the spirit for your time of delight with the Father. And when it was released in the spirit, it went throughout the body of Christ. More, Lord. I bless what you're doing, Holy Spirit. More love right now. This lady right here, the sweeping, more love. She's standing right, can you tap her on the shoulder? There's more love right now, come on. Holy Spirit, let's bless what you're doing with her. Shh. Increase it on her now. I just bless what you're doing, Holy Spirit. Shh. I bless what you're doing, Holy Spirit. This gentleman right here in the black, I just, I just saw the Holy Spirit move right upon you, right over your head. He's hovering over you right now. And I just bless what the Holy Spirit is doing with you right now. Shh. There it is. There it is. Go deeper. Oh! Go deeper. Go deeper. Go deeper. More. 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 Increase. 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 Right. There it is. There it is. There it is. I just, I just saw it. I just saw the Holy Spirit release a gift inside of you. And I feel like there's a gift he just activated inside of you. And I feel like it has to deal with pr the prophetic. And I feel like he's unleashing your tongue to begin to prophesy and declare his words that he's speaking to you. So I encourage you to begin to prophesy. Shh. <laughs> Oh, da 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 ba shan da 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 ba sunday. Shh. 